Hello, my name's Andrew and this is Exploring London, the series where we would normally explore bits of London, but we are absolutely not doing that at the moment. It is the 19th of April 2020 and we are in the middle of the coronavirus lockdown. I too have given up on my sourdough starter, I've considered ending it all over a jigsaw. You can only imagine how tempting it is to go out and shoot videos in all of the empty London streets and call it essential work, uh, but I'm not doing that, um, both because nobody should do that, but also, personally, unfortunately, I currently absolutely actually do have coronavirus. So I'm in the middle of my own self-isolation, I've not seen another human being in the flesh for a long time now, and, uh, and I absolutely cannot leave this flat. But, luckily, I am physically relatively unaffected by the virus, which is, which is good for me, and because of that, I present to you a sloppily constructed video entitled The Past Pandemics of London. Did you think this is the first time this city's been ravaged by a disease? Oh, <laughs> settle in, my friends. There's mentions of something in the writings of the Venerable Bede, uh, the Venerable Bede was a man, he was a monk, who went around and wrote things down in a time where nobody was really writing all that much down. Um, and he spoke of some great disease that swept the country in 664. Now the obvious question is, what actually was London in 664? There can't have been much there. But actually you'd be wrong, there was several thousand people living here in the city. At that point we weren't living in Londinium anymore, which is the Roman settlement. We actually moved out of it and lived in London Vic, which was a sort of trading port to the west of where London was. It's around kind of the Strand and Covent Garden, probably as far as Trafalgar Square. I say we as, as if I lived there. Um, my ancestors were probably living in, in mud holes in the Highlands, so I very much didn't live there. Um, but anyway, we know precious little about the disease that swept the country in the 600s, um, and so there's not much more we can say about that pandemic, but it was something. Another time. But chapter two is called leprosy. Now leprosy we do know a lot more about and it's actually a really interesting disease. It's the first disease, for example, that we ever kind of discovered as, a, as an organism. Like it was the first time we ever looked at something and said, that thing there is causing this disease over here. Um, and it's, it's been with us in Britain since about the fourth century. It causes all sorts of different problems. It causes nerve damage. People tend to lose sensation in their limbs. Then they get skin problems. They don't feel that they've they don't know they've damaged their foot, for example, so they keep sort of walking on it, the damage gets worse, and they get gangrene, and they lose their legs. Um, but people can live with leprosy for several years, and historically we went backwards and forwards about how we felt about it. So sometimes we felt that people with leprosy had to be shunned, and that they were a risk to all of us and had to stay away. And at other times we felt that they were people who had suffered for several years, and were therefore Christ-like. They had lived in purgatory, and they would be going straight to heaven because they had done their, their suffering and their penance during life, and we sort of... Uh, held them up as fine members of society. So leprosy enters Britain in the 4th century, but it takes several hundred years for it to really get going, and it only really takes off in the sort of 1000s, the 1100s, the 1200s. Um, it leaves its big mark on London in the 12th century when we start opening leper hospitals, or leprosariums. The first one was opened in St Giles. You know, St Giles, I've actually, I've actually made a whole video about it. It's that bit at Tottenham Court Road. Um, God, do you remember Tottenham Court Road? There was, there were shops and theatres. There was a McDonald's. Oh, I miss McDonald's. Except the Leprosarium wasn't built at St Giles. It was called St Giles. It was named after the patron saint of the disabled. St Giles, by the way, who's supposed to have been lifelong friends with a red deer. Except the deer would feed him its deer milk. And the hospital gave its name to the area of St Giles, which we still use. And in fact, the chapel of the hospital was run by monks, and the, the chapel was rebuilt several times over, and would later become St Giles in the Fields Church, which still stands there today. Building a new hospital to look after the sufferers of a pandemic. You wouldn't get that today. Leprosy still exists as a disease. People travel back here to Britain from other countries and are diagnosed with it every year. But the last indigenous case of leprosy was diagnosed in 1798, which was also the year that Western explorers first discovered the platypus, 
which cannot be a coincidence. Then we come to the big daddy of pandemics, Yersinia pestis. And I'm obviously not the first person to mention the Great Plague. I'm just wondering, as I look around here and now, whether coronavirus is not our reckoning. In other words, coronavirus or some other kind of virus sweeping across the human well, population. Well, that's true, but then Black Death was a, a virus, wasn't it? Not quite true, David, because the plague was a bacterium, not a virus. But the, the grander point still stands. Look, the year is now 1346. London is a city of about 80,000 residents, and we have now retreated back inside the original city, uh, the one the Romans built, called Londinium. Turns out a walled city was actually quite a good idea, uh, and we realised that when the Vikings came to call. It's 1346, and all the way from the mountains of China comes the deadliest thing that the human population has ever seen. <laughs> the global movement of people and goods was the problem then as it sort of is today, with the plague spreading along down the Silk Road, through the trade routes of Asia and Europe, and eventually it ends up on ships that sail to London, and London gifts it to the rest of the kingdom. But it wasn't humans that were actually spreading it, it was rats. And it wasn't even rats that were spreading it, it was the fleas that were on the rats that were doing it. They would scuttle aboard from ships and you know, roam around the streets of London. The rats would either die or they would just get close enough to humans that the fleas would jump off them, bite us and infect us with the disease. This Yersinia pestis would get in via flea bite and then travel up our lymphatic system to our lymph nodes. In our lymph nodes it would swell into buboes, this is why we called it the bubonic plague, and from there it would get into the rest of our systems. It would cause sepsis, multiple organ failure, and eventually death. Even today, with modern antibiotics, if there was an actual eruption of the plague, it would still carry quite a high mortality rate. So in an era where there was no kind of medicine of any meaningful kind, the bubonic plague was an apocalypse. Now that's the first plague of the 1300s. What we're talking about when we normally think about the plague in London is the Great Plague, which was in 1664 and 1665. But even in between the Great Plague and the First Plague, there were several smaller outbreaks of the plague. It was just a generally plaguey time. Um, so in order to just not get bogged down in that, we're going to talk a bit about the Great Plague now. And where did the Great Plague of the 1600s emerge? Nowhere other than our great friend St Giles in the fields. So what did it look like in London during a plague? Well, the first thing I want to talk about are the searchers of the dead. And they weren't plague specific, but they were basically usually two people employed by each parish, usually a sort of snoopy old woman who would go around every time she heard of a death somewhere, you know, Dorothy down the shop mentions a death or a grave digger tips her off that somebody wants a grave dug for themselves. They would go out look at the dead body and try and ascertain how they died. They'd be like, oh, that one died of consumption, oh, that one clearly burned themselves to death. Um, but what was important about their role is they could be the first people who might discover a plague emerging, which had great importance for the city. There were a few problems with this system. The first thing is they charged each relative for the service of declaring their loved one dead, so you might choose to hide the death. Um, they were capable of being bribed, and so if you didn't actually want people to know that your household had a plague victim, a minute, you could just pay them to not mention it. And they didn't go and see anybody who wasn't an Anglican Christian, so we have absolutely no idea, and it wouldn't have been recorded if anybody died who was a Quaker or a Jew. Not, not like they would be important to know about as well. If your house was determined to have the plague, uh, you would all have been shut inside it, your door would have been locked, you'd have had a big red cross painted, actually like not, not like an X factor, like a, like a Christian cross painted on it. Um, they would often write the words, Lord have mercy on us on the door as a kind of prayer to the people inside. You'd be kept there for 40 days and the parish would employ a watchman to stand outside and ensure that you didn't sneak out at any point during your quarantine. If you didn't die of the plague, or starvation, which happened a lot, then you could leave and go about your daily business until the next time someone in your house looked like they might have died of the plague, and then you'd have to do it all over again. Once again, the authorities created plague hospitals where they would just sort of funnel all the people suffering into them, not because there was any kind of specific treatment, but just to isolate them away from everyone else, and because there was 
absolutely no treatment that they could provide. Uh, and there was other stuff that was happening that would sound very familiar today. The authorities, including the king, left the city. Tick. Uh, businesses all closed. Tick. Only key workers such as physicians, apothecaries and clergymen would continue to travel to work. Tick. Uh, dead carts. These were, these were literally just carts where people would, would roll through the streets with these and they would yell, bring out your dead! And you would have to, like, you know, scoop up your cousin and put them on the back of the cart and the cart would... Yeah, okay, that, that's, that's not happening. The farmers around the outskirts of the city developed this kind of contactless payment type system. So instead of you having to queue outside Sainsbury's two metres apart from everyone else, you would go to the, the edge of the farm and they would have set up an area where you could pick up the produce and sort of take it away without coming into contact with the farmer. And you would pay by dropping your coins into a bucket of vinegar. The idea being that the, the vinegar would, would disinfect the coins. This obviously didn't protect anyone from the plague, but it was a nice idea. In other places, there were other examples of kind of the first infection control measures existing. That whole idea of quarantining people inside their houses. Um, well, the word quarantine it came from the fact that in Venice they used to hold the ships in port for 40 days before they would be allowed to kind of offload their stuff in case that would sort of help spread the, spread the disease around. And it's that Italian word for 40 days which gives us the word quarantine. You would also see uh, that kind of whole plague doctor outfit with the beak. So the idea was they were they were still going on this idea of, of miasma, the idea that the disease spread sort of th invisibly through the air, which in the case of coronavirus, it kind of does. But the theory was that the beaks would be filled with like herbs and they would kind of absorb the plague air and and would protect the doctors, which it didn't. The city cemeteries were soon overwhelmed with all the dead and so they had to start the whole plague pit thing. And again, they were originally kind of next to churches and then eventually just sort of put them anywhere they could find some space. Um, Historic UK have got an interesting little map on their website where you can identify your local plague pit and go and visit it if you wish to. And it turns out in my last video I made about Execution Dock, um, I was wandering around a little spot in Wapping quite a lot, which turns out was a plague pit. So. To the dead of the 1600s, I am I'm very sorry. I am sorry. Sorry. So the plagues were a pretty rough time. Um, after the plagues, of course, we were hit with several more pandemics, but they kind of get progressively less interesting as you go on. So um, obviously smallpox was one of them, smallpox being a disease that we've now eradicated and on the planet, well done us. Um, and there were several influenzas, the Spanish influenza being the really uh, famous one. Uh, and it was during some of those influenzas that we developed practices such as closing schools, or um, encouraging people to self-isolate. We started having kind of mass advertising campaigns about how to protect yourself and other people from, from developing Helping these sorts of illnesses. And the point is that this is a world-changing event that we've got right now. But it is a world-changing event that we have been through several times over. Um, we've been closing things down and socially distancing and self-isolating and quarantining ourselves for multiple centuries. And we do those things because they actually work. And because they work, it's important that we do them properly. And so I'm going to add my voice to all the millions of others in asking you to stay at home and to stay safe. Take it from someone who wasn't allowed to stay at home and had to go out into the dark world and now has this wretched virus, that it is much better if you can just never have it. Um, and by staying inside, you can stop it spreading across the city, stop it spreading across the country, and stop it spreading across the world. So stay safe, stay well, and hopefully, in the not too distant future, when it's sensible to do so, I will see you exploring the streets of this great city once again.